So hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Swarab Dixit, a consultant laparoscopic and robotic surgeon from New Delhi and your faculty for surgery. So welcome to my channel and today I am going to discuss a very important topic which a lot of students have demanded. This is a topic which is very important from a doctor's perspective, from a resident's pers perspective and as a student of you can say uh, those who are uh, appearing for FMG exams, for NEED PG exam, this is very 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 important. So today I'm going to discuss about the role of nutrition in surgery. So we are going to discuss the supplemental nutrition. By supplemental nutrition, I mean the supportive nutrition that we give to the sick patients. So what are the roots? Basically, we have two roots. We have enteral versus parenteral. Now the next question is, sir, which root is actually preferred? Undoubtedly, enteral root is the root via elementary tract so that's the natural way of giving the nutrition and that is the reason why the enteral nutrition is preferred until and unless it is contraindicated when we talk about the parenteral it is delivery of nutrition via elemental in an elemental form via intravenous root so here intravenous root is very 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 important and when we talk about the intravenous root what could be the intravenous root it could be your central venous root so central venous root or it could be the classical peripheral venous root. Now do you know that peripheral venous root has the importance, importance that it is easily accessible and even can access. But the drawback is severe thrombophlebitis. When we talk about the central venous root, one very important thing is that the component of thrombophlebitis is not there. And therefore, when we talk about the parental nutrition, it is the central venous root which is preferred. In central venous root also what is preferred try to understand there is classical jugular so internal jugular vein is one root and the second is the subclavian this is what is very commonly used but when you give the nutrition via internal jugular it is easy no problem but the central line would be hanging over the neck like this so the procedure makes the thing very less ergonomic why because for 18 hours or 20 hours you're getting the nutrition per day and during that phase you it's very problematic because your body's ergonomics is destroyed rather if you use the infraclavicular subclavian vein root the channel lies firmly on your chest wall so the ergonomics is not destroyed so therefore when we talk about the purpose of the nutrition it is the subclavian vein so subclavian vein becomes the answer so subclavian vein subclavian vein is the answer this is what is very 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 important for trauma, when the axis needs to be quick, it is internal jugular vein. So internal jugular vein versus this, this is what is very, 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 very important. Now, as I've already told that what are the indications and what are the contraindications? So it's very important for us to understand what are the contraindications. So contraindication to the enteral nutrition as well as the parental nutrition. So first is when the gut is not prepared, when the gut is not prepared, severe diarrhea. Severe diarrhea is the word, not the diarrhea. Next, severe vomiting, not the vomiting. Severe malabsorption, if there is perforation, if there is peritonitis and obstruction, these are the reasons. And then is sepsis. Remember students, sepsis is a relative contraindication. Then we talk about, sir, what are the contraindications for parental nutrition? Since parental nutrition, we give a high load of carbohydrate, thus any condition which can increase the blood sugar or if there is a pre-existing condition, so hyperglycemia is a contraindication as well as diabetes mellitus. Then COPD because ultimately this carbohydrate will break down into the CO2 and water. So CO2 is going to increase the PSCO2 level. So COPD is one more. Then we have congestive heart failure because increased osmolarity of the plasma, you can say concentration of the uh, of contents will going will withdraw the water from the extravascular space into the intravascular space. Thus, it will precipitate a heart failure. So congestive heart failure is again a contraindication. Remember, head injury, alcoholic withdrawal. In alcoholic withdrawal, al already there is altered sensorium and dextrose is going to consume all the thymine that is available. So it is going to worsen that scenario. In head injury, already there is cerebral edema and increase, you can say, uh, intracranial pressure. And CO2, when it increases in the brain level, it is again going to increase the vasogenic edema component. So it is going to worsen the things. Then metabolic acidosis, etc. Alkalosis, electrolyte imbalance, especially hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. Then students, when we come to the parental nutrition, what are the types of parental nutrition? I've already told you that it is delivery of nutrition via IV route. 
that doesn't mean that if you want to enjoy samosa you will liquefy it and then just inject it no it's via elemental root uh, via element via iv root in elemental form so protein carbs and lipids so we need to decide what are the types of parental nutrition so the first thing that we need to understand is we have something which is known as total and then the second is parental nutrition so based on the root what is tpn and what is ppn so ppn is peripheral parental nutrition tpn is total what is ppn it is given by a peripheral root that is why it is known as peripheral what is tpn it is given by a central venous root that is why it is known as a central uh, total parental nutrition the drawback i have already told you that iv excess thrombophlebitis is very common in the short life the next is on the basis of composition how do we define so it can be whether all the three basic elements that is carb lipids proteins are present so it will be 3 in 1 if not it is 2 in 1 remember volume fraction if we see it is 70 to 80 percent of carb in 2 in 1 there is nothing known as lipids and 10 to 20 percent is protein then we talk about 3 in 1 one very important thing is 70 percent by volume is carb 20 percent is lipid and 10 percent is protein and along with that we have other things like we have insulin we have sterile water for dilution many important micro and macro elements along with that we also have the ppis so this is common in both of them now the problem is sir why there is a need of 2 in 1 versus 3 in 1 now this is what is very important it is a very complex thing to understand but all the developed countries they prefer to use 2 in 1 because the level of nourishment of the people is better than the developing countries and therefore when you give lipids lipids are given in form of omega 6 omega 3 so omega 3 fatty acids they are ecosa their arachidonic acid derivatives so arachidonic acid will ultimately give rise to prostaglandins and prostacyclins which is going to prolong the hospital stay so this is actually to cut short the story the game is whether or no do we need to give lipids why do we need to give lipids because there is a role that lipids will absorb vitamin a d e k so patients who are chronically malnourished or the countries where the malnutrition status is on the higher side basically the uh, developing countries they need this lipid however in developed countries the nutritional status is good not all patients require so why unnecessarily prolong the hospital stay so i will show you the pack of tpn and this is going to be very uh, this is very important for you to understand just see i will show you what how a parental nutrition looks like how a parental nutrition looks like so can you see there are three chambers one is looking something like milk one is a bit turbid i, I usually keep this for the specimen so i think this uh, protein has got a bit denatured and this clear one this clear one is the carbohydrate so this milk part is the lipid so this one is a 3 in 1 now i will try to show you what it is it is written reomex peri so reomex peri is written so here it is written peripheral nutrition so i think it is not going to be visible on this camera so this is a ppn so even ppn and tpn both can be in this form this is a back customized back when we enter uh, when we exert a pressure over this the chambers will you can say this is a three chamber bag the chambers will split and once they split actually the things will be mixed together and once it is mixed together you can just uh, infuse it into the patient's body so this is what is 3 in 1 versus 2 in 1 i'm not going into a lot more uh, you can say uh, lot more detail of this because since this is a summary based video i want to summarize it now when you talk about the content of the content of parental nutrition let us talk about tpn so when we talk about the carb what is the carbohydrate of choice answer is dextrose dextrose is the carb carbohydrate 5 to 10% dextrose is what we give when we talk about the lipids the lipids we give omega 6 fatty acids in form of fish oil so fish oil is there then omega 3 fatty acids in form of soya oil also there is egg lecithin egg lecithin present in this now when we talk about the proteins the proteins is in form of essential essential amino acids now this is what is very 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 important so this is how we define the things now 
one very important thing is what are the complications of parental nutrition so when we talk about the complications of parental nutrition it is very 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 important to understand so complications of parental nutrition the most common complication is hyperglycemia and that is the reason why insulin is there and that is the reason why insulin mediated influx of potassium is there so hypokalemia is again a common complication the second is the fluid overload so fluid overload and because of this you have weight gain so when you talk about fluid overload how is this possible the criteria is weight gain weight gain of the patient more than 1 kg per day more than 1 kg per day this is what is the criteria this is the second most common complication the third most common complication is electrolyte imbalance so electrolyte imbalance is again very important thing now when you talk about electrolyte imbalance then classical question is sir what kind of electrolyte imbalance you expect both hypo as well as hyper can be seen so hypo is more common than hyper and it can be in context why hypo because when you are adding a volume there will be dilutional dilutional factor so obviously hypo is more common and then super added to this because there is influx of potassium a lot of reasons are there so hypokalemia hypophosphatemia hypomagnesemia hypocalcemia hyponatremia hypochloremia as well as hyper also what are the other complications i will not go into that depth because it will make the video very 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 long if you want i can make a separate video on tpn or parental nutrition only that will be helpful but yes apart from that metabolic acidosis azotemia there is a very important event which is known as parental nutrition induced liver failure p n i l f parental nutrition is going to cause hepatic steatosis, hepatic steatosis and also since there is you can say suppression of the endogenous uh, glycogenesis and glucogenesis glucogenesis and gluconeogenesis why because liver has a role of transforming the products into the glucose now since you are taking a lot of exogenous carbs the blood glucose levels are on the higher side so there is a constant suppression of the liver we give a message to liver liver we don't require your work right now you just stay comfortable chronic suppression of the liver is again a problem why because once you stop tpn there is automatically hypoglycemia and why this because of the chronic suppression if you give parental nutrition by a very fast route very fast uh, you can say infusion rate it will cause liver failure so they are very important things then we have reperfusion syndrome so i would make a separate video on that let us quickly try to understand one very important thing the synopsis of the things when should you start the nutrition and when should you stop it so this is what is very 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 important so should i start nutritional support now this is very 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 important so whenever you have a patient with you and you are in a mental dilemma that should i start a nutritional support the very next question you should be asking to yourself is what is the duration of lack of feed now what is this duration of lack of feed that means for this duration the patient hasn't have anything or you can say or 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 so duration of lack of feed or anticipated lack of feed what is anticipated lack of feed i can understand sir patient has not eaten for uh, you can say 10 days but what is anticipated it means that suppose patient has undergone a vipils there could be a possible because of delayed gastric emptying the patient is not having anything for next 10 15 days and you know without nutrition the healing will also be impacted so it's a vicious cycle which it starts if it starts the patient is going to be in a very debilitated state so in this question there could be two answers answer number 1 is sir it is less than 7 days so if it is less than 7 days then there is no need to start with the nutrition right now you can manage it with the fluid and once the uh, once the patient resumes eating okay it's fine but if it is more than equal to 7 days then students you need to start the nutritional support and this is what is very 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 important the next question is sir okay i have decided to start the nutritional support please guide me and tell me whether should i go for enteral versus parenteral so we know the rule of thumb that unless contraindicated it has to be the enteral nutrition so why not ask a simple question is enteral nutrition is enteral nutrition contraindicated this is what is very important 
the answer could be yes it is contraindicated versus no it is not contraindicated students if it is contraindicated one very important thing is that you have to start parenteral nutrition now this is what is very 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 important and if it is not contraindicated then simply you need to start the enteral nutrition now these are two important points for discussion when to start what the next is okay you have decided that i'll go for parental nutrition now in parental nutrition also we have ppn versus tpn so what are you going to start this again means how long do you want to support if you want a very long term duration you will never use the peripheral axis in that case you will put a central line because ultimately one vein two vein the patient will be very anxious with the thrombophlebitis and edema whatever has happened so the next question is what is the duration of support you want so duration of support so you agree that okay i will give parental nutrition but what is the duration for how long do you want the support the answer could be i want it for less than one week so if you want it for less than one week what is the need to put a central venous catheter because it is again having its own complication merits and demerits you have to see so if it is for less than one week then the route of choice will be peripheral and the nutrition will be parenteral nutrition peripheral parenteral nutrition ppn if you require it for more than one week then students please don't waste your time and efforts and don't torture the patient go for a central venous axis and go for tpn these are very 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 important things that we need to understand tpn versus ppn the next is when we want to start the enteral nutrition the next very important thing is okay how long do you want the support here again the question is duration of support now you will say sir why duration of support is a matter here yes because you cannot push anything from oral cavity you have to have a tube and that is why if it is for less than 4 weeks if it is for less than 4 weeks you can use the riles tube feeding so rt feed can be there or students they can be using naso jejunal feed so rt feeding or naso jejunal feeding a lot more depends upon what is the gastric mobility if the gastric mobility or motility is good you can give the rt feed otherwise the patient will have reflux regurgitation aspiration pneumonitis so in that case the nasogenal feed is very important so if a patient is having a delayed gastric emptying or the gastric emptying is not good then go for nj feed similarly if you want it for more than four weeks you cannot put a riles tube the nasal cavity the oropharynx the esophagus that will be atrophied esophagus might form adhesions also fibrotic adhesions so remember for a long duration therapy you need to go for either a feeding jejunostomy feeding jejunostomy or students you can go for feeding gastrostomy the reasons the indications are same so the same concept is if the gastric emptying is good i would go for feeding gastrostomy or I would go for RT feed. If the gastric emptying is poor, I would go for NJ feed or feeding jejunostomy. So this was a summary of what we decided to uh, finish it off today. And normally I take nutrition chapter for maybe approximately two hours. So for the detail, wait for some time. My resident training course is coming. You can always join that on my app. Till then, bye-bye. Do subscribe, do share it with your dear and dear ones. Do comment in the comment section how you liked the video, what you liked about the video and any important other topic you want that I should be making a video for you. Thank you everyone.